You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. They encouraged one another. They prayed for one another. They loved and cared for one another. And it's not to say that they didn't talk about some of those other things, because we do that when we fellowship, for sure, over a cup of coffee and so forth. But what really captivated their time was their commonality with one another. Notice it says here they continued. They continued in fellowship. By the way, we often call the church itself a fellowship of believers. Today, Pastor Ron is sharing the biblical definition of an effective church. You'll hear how this place is run by people who actually believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and live for Him every day. And this church teaches the Bible, the Word of God. They're also a fellowship of believers, a place where people can come together and do life. In fact, it's more than a fellowship, it's a family. And like every family, you won't always agree with one another. But you have the truth of the gospel as your base, and that's enough. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Acts chapter 2 as he begins his message, How to Be an Effective Church. Oh, Lord, how we thank you. You're so good. So good to worship you and be together with family. That's how I feel. I feel like I'm just with my family today. And that's great because we are. We're your bride, the church. And today we get to look at these last verses of chapter 2 and get to see what made the early church tick. What gave them momentum? What allowed them to be highly effective? Because, Lord, that's what we want. We want that in our fellowship, and we want that in our lives. So we pray that you would speak to us as we open up the rich power of God's Word. So bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. We all say amen. So again, here we are, Acts chapter 2. We're going to finish up today in verse 42 to the end of the chapter. And again, we've entitled this whole book Momentum because we really see the church birth, the Holy Spirit given, and the momentum that takes place. It's really phenomenal. I was thinking about that this week. You know, no matter what a person is involved with, you know, whether it's our home life or working on the job, we we want what we do to be effective. We want what we do to matter. And so we want to make a difference on our jobs. We want quality, whatever we're doing, are called to do. We want our lives to matter. And certainly we want to teach that to our children. We want them to grow up making a difference. So most people, by and large, want to be effective. And that's why seminars, whether it's uh, work seminars or family life, are always filled up because people want to make a difference. Well, when it comes to the church, Jesus wants his bride, wants his church to be effective as well. I mean, he wants his church to spiritually thrive. He wants the church to make a difference globally. And uh, so that's really what we see in these latter verses. And that's what we're going to see as we move through the book of Acts. So I've entitled our message today, How to Be an Effective Church. We're going to see really what made this early church so effective and how we could apply that to not only our church life, but our individual lives. So you already see where I'm going because we give you an outline. There are 10 of them that really come out of this passage. So let's jump right in it. And the first thing we see here that made this church effective is that it was a saved church. It says, and they continued steadfastly. Now, the key word is continued. They continued. Jesus said this in John 8 and verse 31. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. In other words, as we stay with the Lord and we continue in our walk with the Lord, it gives evidence that there's fruit in our life and that we're born again. You know, from time to time, people ask me about someone who either used to go to our church or they knew them. They used to go to another church. They used to be in fellowship. But now, you know, 10 years later, they don't go to church anymore. They don't pray. They don't want to be with any of God's people. And they'll ask, what do you make of that? Well, I have an answer for you. 1 John 2, 19. 1 John 2, 19, it says this, they went out from us, for they were not of us. For if they would have continued with us, they would have been with us. But it was manifest, having gone out, they were not of us. You see, staying with the Lord, continuing with the Lord, is evidence that someone is born again. It's evidence of true salvation. It's a sign of that. Have you ever noticed that? Have you noticed this? That as you get older and older, you never stop getting hungry? I've never stopped. It's not like, you know, hey, how are you doing? How is you, what, do you, what do you eat? Well, I grew out of that years ago. I, I don't eat anymore. Oh, really? You're dead then, right? 
there's never a time where you stop eating. I wish I wouldn't eat as much, right? But that's something that's built into your DNA, a desire to eat so that your body is given energy so it can continue to function. If you don't have that craving, then there's something wrong, right? And so it is spiritually. If you're truly born again, you want to continue to grow in God's word. You want to read it. You want to fellowship with God's people. You want to do all the things that we're going to see in this passage before us. Now, there is times, of course, in our Christian walk where our walk can wane. It is possible to even backslide as a Christian, but ultimately the true believer continues. And so this was a church of saved individuals. Now you say, Pastor, isn't that obvious? I mean, we're talking about the church. Of course they're saved. Not necessarily. There are churches all around the world, and definitely in the United States, filled and led by people who are not born again. A good friend of mine, I won't tell you his name, but a good friend of mine actually went through seminary, started a church, and wasn't even saved. He got saved several years after he'd already started a church. Isn't that amazing? But it's not surprising. There are churches today that have boards, and these churches are run by people on their boards that aren't even born again. On several occasions, I've had people come up to me and say something like this, and I've heard it quite a few times. Hey, can you please pray for the church I'm going to? So they either move somewhere else or they have, I haven't talked to them. Can you please pray for the church I'm going to? Because the fact is they, they don't teach God's word. They don't teach the Bible. And in fact, it's very, very liberal. However, I'm hanging in there. And my response to them, my friend, why are you still going there when God doesn't even go there? Right? I mean, it tells us in Revelation 2, 5 that Jesus is not part of a church that doesn't exalt his word. You read in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, and Jesus is on the outside of a church trying to get in. And so over the years, we know that there are churches that really maybe started well that became social clubs. There are actually churches across America, and you can read articles about it, that are closed. The doors are closed, and now they have restaurants in them or other things like that. It's really sad. But I do remember years ago, when, uh, it's at least 12 years ago, I was living in another neighborhood in our area, and I was walking, and I came across a group of neighbors that were talking, and I just kind of got engaged in the conversation. And in the conversation, you know, I, I said, well, I'm a pastor, you know. And the one lady says to me, she goes, oh, I'm Hindu. Oh, okay, she's Hindu. And she goes, but I serve at a church in the area. I'm paid to serve in the children's church. And I thought, whoa, there were so many things wrong with that conversation, right? First of all, what is a church using person that's not even a believer teaching their children's church, number one? And why are you paying people to do that anyway? Shouldn't people in the church automatically volunteer to serve in children's church? Yeah, that's what we do. We volunteer. We serve here, right? By the way, I think they need some help in the children's church. <laughs> it's a perfect place to put a plug, I think, anyway. But that does happen when you have a church that no longer teaches God's word and is filled with people and even run by people that are not believers. And that happens also that over the years when people just want to hear things that they want to hear, they don't want to hear about sin, they don't want to hear about repentance, they want to hear palatable things, smooth things. So listen, as basic as it might sound, nevertheless, it must be stated that if God is going to use a church to be spiritually effective, it must be led by those that are born again, that are saved. Its leadership must be saved. So the first characteristic of an effective church is that it's a saved church. The second thing is this. This church that made them effective, they were a teaching church. So they continued steadfastly. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. Now, I love this. If I were to ask most people, even Christians, if you say, what is the priority of the church? Most people, actually at least be tipped on the greater half, would say it's to evangelize the world. Now, no doubt evangelism is essential and important. We're called to do that. But evangelism, my friends, is the natural byproduct of a healthy church that teaches God's word. The primary task of the church as a whole 
is to teach the Bible, is to instruct God's people. You say, where do you get that? Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 12. It says this, and God gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? Here it is. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So you're to come to the church, get fed in God's word, growing in God's word so that you go out into the world and do it. So that's what we're supposed to do. And by the way, that, of course, that fits our DNA as a church, our vision of the church. We're here to worship, win, disciple, and then send, right? So the first thing that this church is doing to be a functioning church is not only they're saved, but they're teaching and they're involved with sound doctrine, the apostles' doctrine. Now that word doctrine sounds kind of staunch, right? Kind of a churchy term. But the word simply means right teaching or sound teaching or biblical teaching. And of course, they were continuing in the apostles' doctrine, those things that were handed down to them from the Lord. And this is how we grow as a church. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, we grow through the teaching of God's word. In fact, William Barclay said this, quote, we should count it a wasted day when we do not learn something new or when we have not penetrated more deeply into the wisdom and the grace of of God's word, end quote. This is why, and this is what I love about our church and really the Calvary movement, is that we're known as those that will teach the Bible verse by verse, book by book through the entire Bible. That is how we grow. Now, I realize that, you know, there's other things that you could do. You go to a church and they're gonna teach topical messages. I've gone and checked out some of the churches, what they're doing, you know? You can go get maybe a four-part or six-part series on how to do your finances, in a biblical way. Well, that's cool. That's great. Or you can go to another church, and there's actually several in our area doing it, and they're taking all the movies that are currently going on and now showing how that points to Jesus, Superman and whatever. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. But I'll tell you what. I just got to tell you, I got to encourage you what you already know, especially if you've been coming here for a while. If you haven't, then I'm going to tell you this ahead of time. Listen, if you just come and you get through teaching book by book and you get the word of God, you are going to grow like a weed. You really will. You really will, because this equates into our our life, and we're going to grow, and then we can apply it. But the opposite of that is true. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And so think about this. When Jesus even gave the Great Commission to go out, he didn't say, go out and make converts. You know what he said to go out and do? Go out and make disciples. The word disciples is mathetes, and it means a learner, a learner. So the church is to be about the business of making disciples. And how do we do that? The teaching of sound doctrine. In fact, let me share a few verses with you, and you'll hear that theme. This is the Apostle Paul writing to his protege, Timothy. He begins in Titus 2.1. We'll start here, as Paul says it to Titus. Speak the things which are sound for proper doctrine. Then to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 13, until I come, give attention to exhortation and doctrine. Heed to yourself and to your doctrine. Continue in it. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Why? For the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. Yeah, I think you see the theme, right? So mark it, an effective church is one that is relentless to teach sound doctrine, God's word. And again, I'm thankful that we do that. But there are some people that don't like that. Listen, I've, we've had hundreds over 30 years, thousands of people leave our church because we're not an entertaining church. I'm not an entertainer. I'm not here to juggle and make you feel good. I mean, hope sometimes you're feeling good, but sometimes you feel real bad too. Isn't it true? You know, that's when you know good preaching's going on, right? Because God's word comforts the afflicted, but also afflicts the comforted. You know what I'm saying? And there's times where we need to get that, ooh, man, that really got me. I love that. I love that when I read God's word and he gets me. All right, Listen, if I listen, I'm traveling and I love to listen to God's word. I love to listen to other people teaching God's word. I've got my favorites too. And listen, it's a waste of my time if I don't get convicted. I'm like, man, I just got ripped off 30, 40, 50 minutes of my time. I want to hear the word of God. I want to be challenged. So I want to remind you, this is not an entertainment center. 
This is a training center, reading and teaching of God's word. Let's look at the third thing that made this church effective. It was a fellowshipping church. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread. Now, the word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, and it speaks of a commonality on the deepest spiritual level. So when the early church got together, they didn't even get together to discuss, you know, the latest fashion trend or how their, their team was doing at the chariot races, you know. They came together to talk about their mutual faith and trust in Christ. They encouraged one another. They prayed for one another. They loved and cared for one another. And it's not to say that they didn't talk about some of those other things because we do that when we fellowship, for sure, over a cup of coffee and so forth. But what really captivated their time was their commonality with one another. Notice it says here they continued. They continued in fellowship. By the way, we often call the church itself a fellowship of believers. Why? Because we have this mutual partnership with one another. But here's the thing. In order to have that mutual partnership, you got to attend, right? Right? And if you want to grow as a believer, you need to fellowship regularly. That's what the early church did. In fact, look down in verse 44 here. It says, now all who believed were together, together. Verse 46, they continued daily in one accord in the temple on breaking bread from house to house. I mean, they were together gathering on a regular basis. Now, sometimes I, I've met Christians over the years, and I'm sure you have too. I don't go to church anymore. Man, I got, I got so disappointed. I, I'm disgusted with organized church. You know, I've given up on it. I get that. Or the church did something to me, you know. Well, I understand that. But listen, things happen in life, right? Have you ever had any bad food? I've had bad food. I've gotten sick. I've had bad food. Man, man, I have, man, I have food poisoning. I'm never eating again. That's it. I've had it. No more of that food. There's a food theme here going on. I don't know if you noticed that. I don't know what that is. But isn't it true we, we complain about something? Well, yes, of course there's problems in the church. Every church has its problems because it's full of people. You know, so we understand that. And the reality is, is that there's always kinds of excuses we can come up with. And I understand, listen, people being out of fellowship during the pandemic, I get that. There are some people that can't be in fellowship because they, they really do have medical issues. But for the most part, you know, hey, masks off, we're kind of hanging around one another, time to get out of the, you know, out of the house and get in fellowship. Just let me say this. It's unbiblical not to be in fellowship, especially purposely. In, in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, it tells us, let us gather together in order to stir up one another to love and good works. So it's good because we settle. We tend to settle when we're not in fellowship. We settle. So it's good to get together to stir one another up, right? You think of a paint can, the, the paint settles. You got to stir it up before you use it again. We need to get stirred up regular in our love and good works, but beyond that, he then goes, says, not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together, as some do, but all the more exhorting one another as we see the day approaching. Man, the day is approaching, right? Man, I remember, you know, I've been now doing this for 40 years, but I remember, you know, decades ago saying, man, it's getting worse and worse. And I'm thinking because something tragic happened and then it's six months later and like, man, we got to pray, you know, it's. But now it's not six months apart from radical things. It's weeks apart. It's days apart. It's just like every day is, I see it worse and worse and worse. So we got to get ready for Jesus, right? We got to live for Jesus all the more as the day approaches. Think of it this way. Our fellowship is important because we need it as individuals because something supernatural happens when we all gather together. I mean, think of our lives like a babbling brook. And I'm not saying you're babbling. I'm just, you know, I mean, there's nothing, but it's, it's really comfortable just being by a brook. You know, it's beautiful, a little brook, you know. But a brook by itself is not very powerful. It's very slow and everything. But think about many brooks. One brook then gathering together with another brook that meets another brook that meets another brook. All this water meeting together. And soon you have the Niagara. And there's something powerful 
that comes. There's a force to be reckoned with. And when you have God's people gathering together, moving together, there is something that supernatural happens. And it happens when we gather together. If I'm not gathering together with God's people, I miss out on what God's doing in my family. I miss out what God's doing in my community. And I need the encouragement of you. And you need the encouragement of me. We need one another. Besides the fact we need the accountability as well. So as I've shared before, I look at it like coals on the grill, right? You pile up those coals, you get them hot, and they start turning white, you know? But if you take one of those coals with a tongue and you put it off to the side, it doesn't take long with the wind swirling around and everything to get cold immediately. Very soon, you can pick it up with your hand. And that's what happens in our lives when we get outside of fellowship. We grow cold in our walks with Jesus. So we need that mutual heat of one another. By the way, notice the symbol of their fellowship. It says here, they gathered together, not forsaking their fellowship, you know, in the breaking of bread, which definitely is a referral to the communion. They would gather together and they would have communion. And of course, Paul gives instruction to the church in Corinth. They were regularly doing it in their services. But I find that interesting, you know, why is that? Well, because ultimately our commonality comes at the cross. Every single one of us came the same way at the cross, broken, sinners, in repentance. We all have that in common. It's beautiful. Communion is so beautiful. And by the way, the word we use for communion comes from the same word fellowship, koinonia. It's the same word. But listen, if we want to be effective as a church for the glory of God, then we've got to be a fellowshipping church. They go hand in hand, obviously. Number four, I told you I'd say this. Listen, they were effective because they were a praying church. They were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. I've done whole sermons just on prayer. How important is it to actually do it? It's far more important to do it than to talk about it. But we do need to state that they were effective because of their prayer. And we need to pray. As I've said before many times, no prayer, no power. But if we have much prayer, we'll experience much power. These people were steadfast in prayer. You know, it seems like we'll do everything else but pray. We'll get up early to go fishing in the morning get up early to go on a walk if, we, if that's our thing, you know? Or we'll stay up late at night to watch our favorite team play a sport, you know? You know, maybe it's on the West Coast. I got to stay up till 11 o'clock at night to watch these guys play, you know? Or it's staying up late at night playing video games, you know? Or maybe we'll even come to church if there's a good concert going on. Then we'll show up there if there's a good speaker. So we'll find all kinds of ways to do the things we want to do if we like it. But prayer, eh, I don't know about that. I mean, we believe prayer is important. Yes, someone ought to be doing it. I just don't know if I need to do it. But God wants us to be prayer warriors. I'm so thankful. We got some prayer warriors in our church. We got a group of people that meet here every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. I was able to, you know, meet the first gentleman that came in with that group. They meet back here and just say, Dan, thank you for doing that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Because one of the things they're doing is they're praying for me. So I'm like, please don't stop. I need all the prayer I can get. But they're also praying for you. They prayed for you. You were prayed over and for today. That God would open your heart and mind to the things of God. And that you'd grow and all the things that you need. Listen, we, we can do so much more after we pray. But before we pray, who knows, right? Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the hands of the omnipotent God. It's a wonderful thing. And we see that the early church were a people of prayer. If we want to experience spiritual momentum to be highly effective as they were, then we need to operate as the early church. This is the blueprint for the church. This is the church we want to be. Jesus said, my father's house should be a house of prayer. It made him effective. Thanks for joining us here today on Large Than Life as we go through the book of Acts. There may be no better place in the Bible to learn about what it's like to be a disciple. Virtually every verse is a glimpse into the life of these men who had followed and been taught by Jesus personally. 
but now they are left behind after Jesus' ascension to preach and teach the Word of God. They must continue without the physical support of Jesus there to help. That must have been a humbling experience, but how blessed we are that they rose to that occasion. Have you ever felt like that? You finished college or a certification class, and now without the support and protection of the classroom, you have to go out into the world and apply your new skill. It's a little scary. I imagine it must have been something like that for the disciples, too. Here at Larger Than Life, a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint, we want you to know and experience the incredible, awesome love of God. And on our website, ltlradio.org, you'll find so many ways to learn about Him. You can find a link to download our mobile app at ltlradio.org and subscribe to the Larger Than Life podcast. This will give you access to every single one of Pastor Ron's messages and many other encouraging resources. Once again, that website is ltlradio.org. We're at the end of our time today, but we'll be back with more on Larger Than Life.